Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love of finest literature. Just lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing but the temperature of your drink. I hope you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love of finest literature by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends to get updated on future releases. We present Speedy Death by Gladys Mitchell. Dramatized for radio by Elizabeth Proud. With Mary Wimbush as Mrs. Lestrange Bradley, Leslie Phillips as Carstairs, and Michael Cochran as Bertie Phillipson. Speedy Death. I know what I know, and I deduce what I deduce. I am a psychologist, not a policewoman. Accusation is not my business, nor is storytelling. Mr. Carstairs would be a better choice for that. <laughs> he enjoyed the confidence of the police. Well, it's true that as an entomologist, I've had some experience of detective work. It's also true that of all the people involved in this extraordinary affair... I alone was never under suspicion. Not even Mrs. Bradley suspected me. <laughs> True, my friend. <laughs> Continue. It was the August of 1929. Several of us were staying at Janings, Alistair Bing's country house. I'd known Bing a long time. He called himself an archaeologist, though in fact it was only a rich man's hobby. He was a widower, and his unmarried daughter, Eleanor, ran the house. His son, Guard, was a medical student. The story starts on Tuesday the 13th, with young Guard Bing waiting at the railway station for his fiancée. One of the guests, Bertie Phillipson, was with him. There she is, Guard! Dorothy! Over here! In the mount time, too. Dorothy! Hello, God, darling. Hello, Bertie. I didn't expect to see oh, you. Come along, Dorothy, for goodness sake. It's nearly half past six. The house is full of awful people. And dinner's at 7.30. Of all ungodly hours. Dashed early. But you know what old Bing's like. It's very nice to see you again, Bertie. What have you been doing with yourself? Oh, I've been out and about, you know. As I got to know Philipson, I came to realize that he wasn't at all the silly ass he seemed to be. He was older than he seemed, too. He'd fought in Flanders in the Great War, had quite a beastly time, I suspect, though he never spoke of it. He'd known Dorothy well for some time, and I think was in love with her. Still the little lounge lizard, Bertie. Why don't you get yourself something to do? Oh, I don't know. I mean... Not much point, is there? Of course, if you... Well, if things have been different... Oh, Bertie, I'm sorry. I do like you ever so much, but with God, it, it's different. There's something about him. Yes, there is. His size and his beastly temper. You'll have to be a good kid when you're married. I know. You can't think how exciting it is to be scared stiff of your future husband. What are you saying about me, woman? Darling, nothing. Do be careful. I'm sure the driver ought not to take notice of what the people behind are saying. Now, Bertie, tell me about all the guests at Chainings. Is there anyone I know? Uh, let me see. Um, do you know a fellow called Mountjoy? The Explorer? I've heard of him. A large, hairy, loud-voiced, primitive sort of creature with a big black beard. <laughs> oh, rot. He's a little, slim, clean-shaven, shy sort of fellow. In fact, the only person who seems to be able to get two words out of him is, uh, well, who do you think? Not Eleanor. Eleanor it is. In fact, she's engaged to the fellow. Unofficially, of course. Pull yourself together, Bertie. I've never seen anything so wildly improbable as Eleanor's behaviour with men. You'd never think she was Guard's sister. Then there's Mrs. Bradley. Know her? 
little, old, shriveled, clever, sarcastic sort of day. I believe she's a witch. Good old spot, though. Friend of yours, isn't she, guard? Huh? Didn't she get you out of a rather nasty scrape on boat race night That's with a... That's enough, Bertie. Whoops! Sorry, old man, enough said. Nobody quite knew who she was or why she had been invited. When I asked her later, she only laughed. <laughs> then there's a chap named Carstairs. Very decent, scientific sort of bloke. Beetles or something. And that's a lot. Apart from your future par in law. Mm, still as bad tempered as ever, I suppose. Oh, well, Bing's not so bad if you don't see too much of him. He can't stand Mrs. Bradley, by the way, but he gets on famously with Carstairs and the Mountjoy Chappie. <laughs> Mountjoy? Uh, Mountjoy, the fellow's an ass. Oh, he's certainly very late for dinner. Do you know, Carstairs, this very afternoon, that that nincompoop, that Everard Mountjoy, stated as his considered an expert opinion that the mound on Belden Down isn't an ancient British earthwork, but the remains of a bunker on the old golf course. Oh, really? oh. Ridiculous fella. What <laughs> a <laughs> clown. <laughs> Begging your pardon, sir. Well, what is it, Mabel? Uh, I mean, Cobb. If you please, sir, Parson says that Mr Mountjoy went to take his bath upwards of an hour ago and has not reappeared. Oh. Oh. Reappeared? What do you mean, reappeared? Fella isn't a disembodied spirit, is he? <laughs> Tell Parsons to go and knock at the bathroom door. Ridiculous fella. What are you waiting for, Cobb? If you please, Miss Eleanor, Parsons has hammered and hammered at the bathroom door and there's no answer. We think the gentleman must have been taken ill. Nonsense, nonsense. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. I remember that a friend of mine fainted in the bath some four years ago. She drowned. I say. Oh, really? Mrs. Bradley, how yes. terrible. Uh, I think I'll go and yes. see if there's anything wrong. Yes, indeed. I I'll come with you, guard. Oh, very well. But the whole thing's ridiculous. I say, Eleanor, uh, do you think I should go too? No, Bertie, of course not. I expect it's all a false alarm. If you're not going to eat any more, Dorothy, the girl can remove the plates. Cobb! Guard's legs were longer than mine. By the time I reached the upstairs landing, he was already subjecting the bathroom door to a vigorous hammering. I must have fainted. Vote we break in. Uh, half a moment. We might as well try the handle first. Sorry. Uh, good heavens, it wasn't locked. Well, I'm damned. It's a woman. I say, she's dead. <gasps> A doctor! A doctor! I'll telephone! Where the devil is Mount Joy, though? There's no doubt she's dead. No doubt about it. I've studied enough medicine to be sure of that. It's a weird business, isn't it? What the devil was she doing having a bath in our house? Who is she? How did she get in? And a devil of a lot of other things. Such as? Such as the bathroom window being wide open, top and bottom, and the door being unlocked. And where's that chap, Mountjoy? There. Dead. What did you say? I know it's a shock, but we have to face it. That woman is Mountjoy, all right. And I shouldn't tell your sister. Tell Eleanor? But you'll have to know. About the death of Mountjoy, yes. The fact that Mountjoy was a woman, no. I... Oh, yes. I get you. Rather bad luck to find out that the chap you're engaged to is a woman. <laughs> what? <laughs> God, stop being a fool. It was no use. I'm afraid young Bing made a poor fist of breaking the news to his sister. He's dead. Huh? Who? Why, Mountjoy, of course. That's why he didn't come down to dinner. He couldn't. He was drowned in the bath. God, what do you mean? I mean that Mountjoy is dead. As a doormat. But look here. Well, I can't stop. Doctor will be here any minute. Not that he can do anything. Poor fella. Dead as a door now. Well, I think we might repair to the drawing room now. According to Bertie, even Mrs. Bradley looked astonished at that. Next morning, I came upon that redoubtable woman talking to Bertie on the veranda. 
Good morning, Mr. Carstairs. You are just in time for a serious intellectual discussion. Oh? Yes. And Mr. Philipson here thinks that an accident took place in this house last night. Oh? Now, I think it was a suicide. Oh. I can trust you two people not to act idiotically if I tell you something very unpleasant, I suppose. Oh, certainly. Of course. There was murder committed in this house last evening. Ah, fancy that. What do you say, Carstairs? I say murder. Carefully planned, deliberately executed murder. First, there is the queer fact that although a man known to the scientists of two continents as Everard Mountjoy went into that bathroom, we found an unknown woman drowned there, and no trace of Mountjoy except his dressing gown. What? A woman? But dash it! Guard said that the dead person was Mountjoy. Yes. You mean that Mountjoy went into the bathroom, locked the door, flung off his dressing gown and turned into a woman? It seems incredible. It does, but it must be the truth. Besides, he did not lock the door. Didn't lock the door? No. Nope. Extraordinary. Yes, rather. Especially as... Uh... Yeah, exactly. Then there's another thing. Yes? The bathroom window was wide open at the bottom. Well... But uh, doesn't that show that the real Mountjoy, the man, left the bathroom by the window and that the woman, whoever she was, then entered the bathroom the same way, or by the door? No, I'm afraid it won't wash, Philipson. First, where did this woman leave her clothes? Secondly, why should Mountjoy take the trouble to climb out of the window when he could just have walked out of the front door? Thirdly, why should a strange woman break into a house and have a bath. Oh, it's not usual, to say the least. Precisely. No, no. Mountjoy was the lady, and the lady was Mountjoy. And I intend to avenge his death. Bravo! How do you intend to begin? Have you any proof? Will you inform the police? I have a clue, but I don't know where it is. Uh, there, there may be a case for the police. No, will you excuse me now? I must talk to Bing. Of course, somebody in this house did it. You realise that fact, don't you? But look here, you're not suggesting that I murdered the poor devil, are you? I accuse no one. No, but seriously, do you tell me that one of these quite ordinary, well-bred, decent, civilised people committed a beastly and unreasonable and illogical crime last night? I simply cannot believe it. Oh, you must. You must get it well into your head, and then... You had better prepare for yourself a sound, foolproof, watertight, gilt-edged alibi. For Mr. Carstairs won't rest until he gets a noose around somebody's neck. Well, I'm blessed. Anyone might imagine you thought I did it. Do you, Mrs. Bradley? No, oh, I'm not concerned a bit with whether you did it or not. I'm concerned that you do not get hanged for it, young man. Somebody will be hanged, you see. Oh, yes. <laughs> and it won't be me. Well, I... Oh, no, go on, you say it. No, it might be used in evidence against me. I don't trust you, you see. <laughs> I found Alistair Bing in the library in his most truculent mood. I take it very ill that you should suggest that such a thing as a murder could occur in my house, Carstairs. All kinds of wild rumours may spread. <laughs> Look here. I feel that we should at least try and prove whether the dead body is that of Everard Mountjoy. There can be no doubt, Alistair. Didn't Mountjoy lose two fingers on the left hand after an accident on one of his hunting trips? Yes, he did. Those two fingers on the left hand of the corpse are missing. Oh, God. Oh, there'll be an inquest, of course, and all sorts of scandalous tales bandied about. Eleanor will be most upset. Yeah, maybe, but what concerns me is the fact that Mountjoy was murdered. You have no proof. You have no right to make such a statement. The unholy act, if that is what it was, was carried out at a time when everybody was dressing for dinner. That is to say, at a time when nobody can fully account for himself or herself. Upon my word, Bing, you're quite right. And then there's the fact that the intruder knew that Mountjoy wouldn't even cry out at the sight of him as he clambered in through the window. Ah, but the murderer didn't get in by the window. Why didn't he? Because it's a physical impossibility. 
the bathroom window is at least 20 feet above ground level and there's no foothold for climbing. But there's a balcony outside Miss Clark's room next door. Oh, nonsense. It's too hideously dangerous an undertaking for words. No sane person would dream of attempting it. No sane person. Mm. Look here. We can soon settle whether or not it is a possible feat. Let us have another look at the bathroom. Oh. Rubbish! Mountjoy can't have been drowned. People don't allow themselves to be drowned as easily as all that. Don't they? Take off your coat and, and get into the bath. Oh. No, it's quite dry. Uh, come on, come on, oh. get in. This is a serious demonstration. Oh, it's ridiculous nonsense. Uh, come on, man. Uh, by the way, which of us two do you take to be the stronger? Well, myself, undoubtedly. I am both taller and heavier than you. And fitter, too, no doubt. Sit down. Oh, really, Carstairs, this is a waste of time. Good. Now, I sit here on the edge of the bath. I'm talking to you on a subject which vitally concerns both of us. Rubbish, look, I'm tired of this foolery. I'm going to get... Now, mind your head. What? D there. Ah! Ow! Yes. Oh! No, no, no. Oh. Having, oh. having caught you off balance by pulling your feet upward, I proceed to hold your head underwater until you lose consciousness. You see... Oh, what? Mere horseplay. <laughs> Well, I, I didn't intend it as such, and I'm sorry you bumped your head, uh, but as a demonstration of how Mountjoy probably met his death, or rather her death, I, I, I think it was rather successful. Now, scientifically speaking, don't you agree? Well, I see your point. Yeah, that balcony does come pretty close. It'd be child's play to step over onto the sill. And this window's an ordinary sash, so he... Pulled it open, climbed in, and... Oh, look here, though. The inside sill's a bit high, isn't it? Uh, more than four feet. What did he put his foot on, I wonder? The bathroom stool. My clue. Where? Gone, man. Gone. It was under the window, and the murderer stepped onto it, and his shoes left some mark. So he took it away with him, hid it. It would give him away. Yes, I see. Find the stool, find some shoes which could have marked or stained the stool, find the owner of the shoes, and there's your murderer. Neat! Well, too neat. Can't be as easy as that. Uh, no. L look, I suggest that we try to reconstruct the crime. Shall I do the climbing, or will you? Yeah, well, we could do with an assistant, I think. Oh, look! There's Philipson crossing the lawn. Let's enlist him. Yes, I follow, Mr. Bing. I'm to hike over this balcony railing, mm -hmm. shove my toe on that bit of flattened water pipe, and heave my other knee onto the bathroom window sill. That's right. I it is the bathroom, isn't it? It is. The bathroom? Yes. Oh, I twig. Do you really think that's how he got in? Tough young egg, the murderer, I mean. Well, here goes. Well, I think we should go uh, back to the bathroom and witness the oh. experiment from there. Don't you, Costas? Uh, excellent. Help! 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 Let me down! Help! Help! I can't get down! Here you are, Father. Put this stool somewhere for me, please. Aha! Uh -huh. Why Cobb should have put two stools in the upstairs bathroom and none in this is more than I can explain. Got it. Really, uh, Mr. Carstairs, uh, no need to snap. Oh, I'm so sorry, Miss Bing, but it is essential that I examine the stool. Help! I can't get down! Dear me, Bertie. If you wish to do physical exercises, I wish you would find somewhere a little less dangerous. You might have jumped, you idiot, instead of sitting there gibbering. Well, if I had, I should have gone clean through the floor. Well, that proves that the murderer must have had something to step down on. But not the stool, eh, Mr. Carstairs? It's as clean as a whistle. Yeah, uh, guard quite right. Rather puts an end to your theories, I'm afraid, Carstairs. And where's the motive, anyway? Yes, indeed. I'd give a good deal to know what motive anybody in this house had for murdering Mountjoy. Exactly. No, I'm afraid it was just a nasty accident. <sighs> oh, um, and by the way, all of you, I'm sure I needn't ask you not to let Eleanor know that Mountjoy was really a woman. It's bad enough for the poor girl, without breaking her pride as well as her heart. I must say, Father, she shows no sign of a broken heart, as far as I can see. Although you never really know what old sis thinks or feels about anything. Still, it's devilish awkward having to remember that she doesn't know her young man was a young woman.
After a sleepless night, I took myself off to the summer house to think things out. I just decided that what I really wanted was an intelligent listener. When Mrs. Bradley popped up, for all the world, like a Cheshire cat. There's something peculiar going on in this house, and it perturbs me. You do think it was murder? Oh, yes. And the clues must be all round us, but we can't even see them. Well, we know some. Window open at the bottom, unlikely deceased would have had it so. Door unlocked, unlikely deceased would have neglected to lock it. Bathroom stool missing. Oh, that's been found. My best clue's gone west. Oh, found? Where? In the bathroom, on the top floor. The maid appears to have put two stools in the upper bathroom and none in the lower one. Mm, that is exceedingly amusing. Did you question the maid about it? Uh, no, but Miss Bing said... Oh, Eleanor, what exactly did she say? Oh, merely that she found two stools in the upper bathroom and couldn't imagine what Cobb had been thinking about. You don't think she was lying? Oh, if Eleanor said she found two stools up there, she was probably speaking the truth. But do you mean to tell me that you didn't have a look at the other stool? Good heavens, what a fool. I mean, you mean that the other stool... Exactly. Oh. Oh. Too late, my friend, I fear. Oh, fiddle. Oh. Oh. Uh, not, not proven. Wonderful what a little turpentine will do. I... Are you, are you a witch? No, or merely a fairly observant human being. Mm, well, of course you're quite right. Mabel Cobb told me that Miss Bing noticed a mark of paint or tar on the cork top and gave orders that it should be cleaned off. Hence the strong smell of turpentine hanging about the house yesterday. Seems to me that Eleanor couldn't shield the criminal better if she knew who he was. You think she knows something? You must question everyone slowly and patiently. Yes, but supposing they object? They will love it. Well, shall we start with Alistair Bing? What exactly are you attempting to insinuate, Carstairs? Oh, insinuate! <laughs> yeah. uh, come now, Bing. I mean to avenge Mountjoy's death. Aren't you going to help me? No, I am not. I didn't like Mountjoy, and I don't mind who knows it. We never got on together. I'm not sorry that she's dead, but the whole thing is a confounded nuisance. There, now. I'm sure you feel better for having said that, Mr. Bing. Yes, I do. Poor Mountjoy. Oh, so you still think it was murder, Carstairs? If so, the best thing you can do is to lay your suspicions before the police. I'm not at all anxious to call in the police, and I'll tell you why. I believe I know who the murderer is. What do you know? I know about the open window, the unlocked door, the disappearing stool, the stool which reappeared but in the wrong bathroom, the rightful stool which had been soiled and was cleaned with turpentine, and then, of course, there is the... The missing watch. Yeah, you what? Missing watch? What missing watch? Oh, only my little joke. Gah. I'm going to call in the police at once. I refuse to have my house turned into a shark Holmes's paradise. Poor Alistair. I can't help sympathising with him over the private detective business. Now, do you recognise this watch, Mr Carstairs? Oh, so there really is a watch. It's Mountjoy's, of course. What about it? It wasn't in Mountjoy's bedroom after her death yesterday. I know because I looked for it. And this morning, I found it. It was at the bottom of the jug on Mountjoy's washing stand. The jug was three quarters full of water. Drowned watch, drowned woman. What? Why did he, I, I mean, she, keep a watch in the toilet jug? I mean, it seems utterly idiotic. <laughs> Put another word in place of idiotic, and I think you've hit it. Mm -hmm. Mad? 
Mountjoy was mad, and it wasn't murder, thank goodness, but suicide. Oh, I'm so glad you found that watch. Are you? Well, I hate to undeceive you, but it was most certainly a murder. And not Mountjoy, but the murderer was mad. Oh, but, well, in that case... Mm. Oh, please go on. Oh, nothing. You were going to say that if I'm right, then your conclusion as to the murderer's identity must be wrong. Good heavens. Is it clairvoyant? Merely applied psychology. So now, do tell me who you thought it was. I thought it was you. Too gorgeous. Oh, I'm awfully flattered. <laughs> uh, no, it really was rather a neat method of putting out of the way a person one disliked. Only I shouldn't have forgotten that I'd left the window wide open. Besides, I'm not quite long enough in the leg for that climb from the balcony to the bathroom window. I tried it this morning before anyone was up and found I couldn't quite manage it. Ah, a very obvious point, which would certainly have occurred to me later. But in any case, I'm convinced now that you didn't take Mountjoy's life. You see, whichever way you turn, you come up against this snag. Who had a motive for killing that poor woman? Poor woman. Poor woman. I don't follow. Ah, there goes the gong for lunch. I will leave you to cogitate, Mr. Carstairs. Drowned watch. Drowned woman. Poor woman. Mm. Mrs. Bradley really was extraordinary. If I hadn't been convinced that she wasn't the murderer... I should have been equally convinced that she was. Drowned watch, drowned woman, indeed. Meanwhile, however, Alistair had already taken a hand in the matter. After lunch, he called me into the library. Caster, let me introduce you to the Chief Counsel of the County, Sir Joseph Mitchell, and Inspector Boring. I've invited them to make a quite informal preliminary investigation. How do you do, Sir Joseph? Do you? Inspector? Afternoon. Ah, the gentleman with the theories. I've read your notes, Mr. Carstairs. Very interesting. Very. You haven't actually questioned people, though. Well, not having any official standing, I felt I... Quite so. Now, uh, the man who first raised the alarm... Uh, Parsons. Sir. Correct. Did he valet Mountjoy? Well, he would lay out a clean shirt and turn bath taps on and so forth. But he was never required to render more personal services. Of course, that's all quite comprehensible now. Uh, yes, yes, the uh, sex business, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I should like to see Parsons a moment, if I may. And perhaps we might go up to the bathroom. Uh, Parsons, you remember running the bath for Mr. Mountjoy on the evening of his death, don't you? Uh, yes, sir. Did you turn on both taps at once? Uh, no, sir. The hot tap first. I then tested the temperature of the water with the bath thermometer and reduced the heat by means of the cold tap to the number of degrees specified by Mr. Mountjoy, who was very particular in such matters. <laughs> Evidently. Now, would you remember exactly how high up the bath the level of the water was when you had finished your elaborate preparations? Uh, yes, sir. About uh, there. Got the measure, boring? Sir? Good man. Um, 9.3 inches down, sir. Uh, but look here. When we took the body out, the water was right up to the overflow pipe. Was it now? Uh, yes, Boring? 5.1 inches down, sir. Oh, this becomes interesting, Boring. Mm. Parsons, I want you to think carefully. At what time did Mr Mountjoy enter the bathroom? Uh, ten minutes to seven, sir. And what time was it when you heard him turn the water on again? Uh, Seventeen minutes past seven, sir. I remember because Mr Mountjoy was what you might call a... Quick bather, sir. Uh, in and out and dry and half-dressed inside a quarter of an hour he was. Oh. That's why I was particularly surprised he took such a long time that evening. Then uh, I heard the taps turned on. Taps? Both taps? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, both at once. The two make quite a different noise from just the one. Quite so. 
Go on. Uh, well, sir, I was puzzled. It was so unusual. In all the six weeks Mr. Mountjoy was here, I'd never known him stay in the bath like that. Hmm. Now, one more question. Who came out of this bathroom directly afterwards carrying the bathroom stool? Well, nobody, sir. How could they? There was nobody in there except Mr. Mountjoy. Were you there the entire time? I did go away for about three minutes, now I think of it, sir. Oh, why? Miss Eleanor had asked me to speak to Mabel Cobb about the flowers, sir. Oh? Oh, yes, sir. Immediately after lunch, Miss Eleanor said, Oh, you might just tell Cobb that I've ordered more roses for this evening. She'd better see about them at once. Well, I'd forgotten. Uh, but when I heard Mr. Mountjoy turn the taps on, I thought I'd just have time to run downstairs. I see. Thank you, Parsons. You have been of tremendous assistance. Thank you, sir. There goes an innocent manservant of impeccable bearing and a model witness, or one of the cleverest criminals unhung. And for the life of me, I can't tell which. Well, you don't mean that you think Mountjoy was murdered? I haven't the slightest doubt of it being. I shall need to interview the entire household to find out who can be acquitted of suspicion. Bing had been right about the awkward time of the murder. None of us had an alibi, apart from Mrs. Bradley. Come, Mr. Carstairs. All the servants have alibis as well. Uh, by the way, you haven't forgotten the cliff walk you promised to show me, have you? Cliff walk? Yes. I want to talk to you, and we daren't talk here. No. Here comes young Philipson already. Oh, I say, I, I feel all of a dither. My delicate constitution won't stand much more of this. Um, look here. I'd like to tell you people something, and then perhaps you'll advise me whether to tell that policeman, Johnny. Yes? Well, it's only this. You know what a devil of a time Mountjoy was in that bathroom? Yes. Well, I waited and waited, you know, until at last I got so fed up that I went and twisted the handle of the door to hurry him up a bit. Her. Y yes, her. Well, I, I swear the door was locked. There. Ah. Oh. And then someone inside squeaked out... Don't come in! Just like that. High-pitched, you know, and nervous. Well, of course, I yelled, Sorry! And came away. And it was after that I met you, Carstairs, mm -hmm. coming out of the top-floor bathroom. Yes, I remember. Yeah, well? It wasn't Mountjoy's voice. What? I'm sure it wasn't. Mountjoy's voice was low-pitched and rather harsh. But this voice was high and rather shrill. An absolute woman's voice, if you understand me. Scared, you know? Well, that's quite comprehensible, I think. You startled Mountjoy badly, I expect, and in her terror, lest you should discover her secret, she shrieked at you in her normal instead of her disguised voice. By Jove, I never thought of that. Jolly brainy of you to have thought that out, Mrs. Bradley. Opinions differ. Do you, uh, do you think I ought not to tell the police after all, then? I should say not yet. I'll keep mum, then. Thanks very much. And now for our walk, Mr. Carstairs. Let us make for the sea. Hmm. Oh, delightful. Mm, very. But we didn't come just to enjoy the sea air, did we? No, no. Queer about that voice young Philipson heard. Hmm. It must have been Mountjoy. Oh, impossible. Mountjoy must have been dead by that time. Uh, yes, but your own perfectly plausible explanation just now... Merely to put young Philipson off the scent. You see, the guilty person must never know that anybody suspects anything. It would be fatal. If my deductions are correct... And as they're based on pure psychology, I don't suppose they'll turn out to be at fault. We have to deal with a person who values life so little that she will stick at nothing. She? But surely this wasn't a woman's crime. I am sure of it. But the climb from the balcony to window? Not at all difficult. 
I could do it if I were an inch longer in the leg. Look here. Who knew that Mountjoy was a woman? No one. Are you sure? Surely you can put your finger on the person in the house who hated Mountjoy with the intense and bitter hatred of one whose, whose finest feelings, whose noblest emotions have been played with, huh? mocked at, scorned, derided. Good God, of course. Let us go back to the house. Mm. Oh, mm. poor, poor girl. Yes. Do you really mean that? Of course. We're all murderers. Some in deed and some in thought. This one saw her opportunity and took it. Dinner, by tacit consent, was a cheerful meal. Only Bertie Philipson appeared preoccupied, and after dinner, Mrs Bradley dragged him out into the moonlit garden. Uh, Mr Philipson, we can speak freely out here. Eleanor's been making herself a nuisance to you, hasn't she? What? How on earth do you know? Tell me all about it. Well, uh, when I stayed here two years ago, Eleanor began to suggest that I should, well, fall in love with her, I suppose you call it. Mm -hmm. Once, uh, she asked me outright to marry her. I uh, tried to let her down lightly, you know. Then she made a, a suggestion. I can't go into that. But I let her see how horrified I was and made some excuse to old Bing and left. Well, I only came down here this time because God said Eleanor was engaged and I was keen to see Dorothy again. Mm -hmm. And I thought Mountjoy had probably put me out of the running. Yes. Well, all was right as rain until Monday evening after dinner. And then she started leaning against me and trying to hold my beastly hand. It was awful. Monday? Are you positive? The day before Mountjoy died? Positive? Because I remember thinking on Tuesday, Eleanor will surely have more sense of decency than to come and maul me tonight. And it was all right on Tuesday night. But on Wednesday, th that is, last night, well, she came to my bedroom about half past twelve and... and wanted to stay there. I had to shove her outside and lock the door. Choice, isn't it? Well, of course, you will lock your door tonight. You bet I shall. Yes. Well, leave everything else to me. Hmm. Shall we go in? Ah, here you are, Bertie. Hello, What about the light fantastic, Father? Shall we be treading on your corns? House of mourning and so on? What's that? I thought we'd have some dancing. Oh, oh yeah. by all means, my boy, if the others would like it. Brother! I shall go to my study. I think I'll come with you, Father. I could look up your references for you, if you like. Oh, I'm glad Sis has gone. She hates dancing. Right, what shall we have? Uh, foxtrot is the only thing I can manage. Foxtrot it is. <laughs> I'll work the machinery. No. No, oh, you won't. Oh. Take Dorothy. She refuses to dance with me. Carry on. Come on, then, Dorothy. Uh, Mrs. Bradley, will you do me the honor? The honor is all mine, sir. I say, um, nice. you don't think that weirdo woman is the juicy Jimmy who did in that mount joint, do you? Mrs. Bradley. Oh, oh good gracious, no. Uh, all right, only to me. A little touch of reverse. That's the way. Only to me. She looks the sort of Caesar Borgia Nero de Medici who would fluff out her own mother for the fun of it. Don't you think so? She's a very gifted woman. Bertie, where are we going? Out into the hall. <laughs> More room to uh, uh, don't you know? So that I can um Priest! <coughs> don't you know that I'm on the verge of being married to God? More's the pity. <laughs> oh, let go, idiot! Oh, Eleanor. I say, Eleanor, uh, please go and ask God to shove on a waltz. I feel in the mood for it. So it appears. Tell him that I'll lend him his wench for the next dance for three. <laughs> if he's a good boy, that is. Oh, put me down, fool. <laughs> Quicker, I'll tell my young man. Such goings on. There, there, my pretty one. <laughs> Did I ruffle its pretty feathers then? <laughs> <laughs> oh, what the? That's my clock, you bastard.
bad girl. Be careful, Dorothy. You'll cut yourself. Any damage? Fall around. Good heavens, what a fuss. I'm so sorry, Dorothy. Don't mention it. It really doesn't matter a scrap. Uh, Dorothy, dear. I leave them to clear up the mess and come out for breath of air. Did you say it was your clock? Your own actual property? Yes. I always take it with me when I visit people. It's like a friendly voice if I wake up in the night. But why should Eleanor be carrying it about the house? What were you doing when she dropped it? That ass Bertie was trying to kiss me. He doesn't mean anything by it. I see. Dorothy, I want you to do something for me. I'm going to make a little experiment tonight. Would you mind sleeping in the other twin bed in my room? Well, I... It, just for one night. And you mustn't tell anyone what we're going to do. Not even guard? Mm. You see, ever since the, the murder, I haven't felt safe with anyone except guard. I had a bad car smash last year and it's made me stupidly nervous. Mm -hmm. I know it's silly, because the only person who had any reason to do such a dreadful thing was the most unlikely of all of us. Who? Why, Eleanor. What makes you say she had a reason? Well, I know she wasn't happy because she came into my room weeping and saying she didn't know what to do. About what? About her engagement. I said if she felt unhappy about it, she should break it off. Excellent advice. And what did Eleanor say? That she'd have to go through with it because of the shame. Of course, you can see what I thought she meant, Mrs. Bradley. Even though I could scarcely imagine Prim Eleanor getting herself into that sort of muddle. But now I know she must have... Yes? Well, found out about Everard Mountjoy's sex. So really, it was a blessing he... I mean, she was drowned from Eleanor's point of view. Yes, I expect that was Eleanor's point of view. When did this touching conversation take place, by the way? While I was getting ready for dinner on Tuesday, I'd only just arrived, you know, and I realised I'd left my powder compact in the motor, so I had to dash down and get it. Leaving Eleanor in your bedroom? I see. Well, my dear, you may tell your fiancé about tonight's experiment, but nobody else. Listen while I tell you what to do. Here I am, Mrs. Brown. Finished everything? Yes, everything. The, the dummy looked horribly lifelike in my bed. I put my shingle cap on it. I'm cold. No, scared. Never mind. Get into bed. Quietly, mind. It's tremendously important that no one knows you're here. Good night, my dear. What did you think it was? Oh, isn't it horrible? Yes, it is, but it might have been worse. Wasn't you screaming and dying? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Eleanor, do please calm yourself and speak coherently. Oh. And silence, please. Oh, Mabel, Parsons, silence. Now then, Eleanor, tell us what has happened. I had neuralgia, mm -hmm. and I thought Dorothy might have some aspirin. So I went into her room to ask for it, mm -hmm. and... And, well, go and see for yourself. It's horrible. Horrible! God, don't leave me out of this side until I come back. Oh, right. No, 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 no. Come along. Come with me. I'm going to give you something to make you sleep. And when you've taken it, I'll send someone along to see how you are. No! No! Don't send anybody. I only want to be left alone. Please! The rest of us went into Dorothy's room. Lying on the bed was a dummy, its head cunningly fashioned from a Guy Fawkes mask, partly obscured by a rose-pink shingle cap. 
Gruesome enough in all conscience, but what was infinitely worse was the fact that the head was staved in as though from a terrific blow, and lying across the dainty coverlet was a heavy poker. We were still recovering from our first sight of this monstrosity when Mrs. Bradley arrived. Just look at this, Mrs. Bradley, will you? I think we must be harboring a maniac. <gasps> mm, yes. Nasty. Nasty? It's frightful. The poker. Yes. But, but supposing I had been lying there instead of... instead of the dummy? Well, you weren't. So it's all right. But I should have been, if it hadn't been for Mrs. Bradley. Hey, What's that? Oh, it's true. I should have been sleeping here tonight if Mrs. Bradley hadn't suggested this experiment. You mean it was your idea to fashion this frightful effigy, Mrs. Bradley? Uh, but had you any reason, uh, any inkling of any... Just an intuition. Oh, rubbish, rubbish! Good Lord, Father. There's no need to be rude to Mrs. Bradley. I think this is the most ghastly attempt at murder I ever knew about. Of course. Oh, oh, how foolish of me. I'm so sorry I said that. Uh, where shall I take her? Your room, Mrs. Bradley. By all means, I shall accompany you. And I suggest that everyone should try to get some sleep. We can continue our discussions at breakfast. <laughs> I thought the end of the world was come, and that we were listening to the last shriek of the dead. Mm, so did I. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Eleanor is apparently washing off the shock. At least the bathroom door was locked, and I assumed it was Eleanor. Uh, poor Eleanor. By the way, Bertie, mm? where were you last night? Well, I, I did begin to get up, but uh, when I saw the mobs of people on the landing, I thought I might as well get back to bed. Well, I'm jolly glad Dorothy was sleeping in Mrs Bradley's room. I knew she was going to, of course. Yes, so did I. What? I uh, overheard your conversation with Dorothy. The devil. So you knew where she was all the time? Yes, uh, but it's a beastly business. I mean, anyone who would want to put a topping girl like Dorothy out of the way must be absolutely mad. Uh, Eleanor! What? What's Eleanor! Matter, oh, oh, where oh, is, is Eleanor? In the bathroom! That, is, that horrible place! Oh. I should have locked it up and disconnected the water. Get her out! <laughs> this time the bathroom door was locked, so we forced it open while Mrs. Bradley telephoned for the doctor. Sure enough, Eleanor was inside, clad in her dressing gown, lying over the side of the bath with her head touching the bottom. Oh, heavens! Good God! She's drowned. We carried her into her bedroom and attempted artificial respiration. Bertie worked like one possessed. Eventually, the doctor arrived. That's enough, Philipson. You're exhausted. You take a turn now, young Bing. Right you are, doctor. She wasn't actually in the bath, you say, Mr. Carstairs? No. Her feet were on the floor, but her head was touching the bottom of the bath. She had the waist plug chain twisted round her hand. So there was no water in the bath? No. There's another thing, Doctor. <coughs> uh, doctor! Ah, that's it. She'll do. A dose of sal volatile, and she'll be as right as rain. Oh, oh. Phillips. Oh, 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 oh. oh he's passed out. <coughs> Silly fool. Pull him off her. Might cause the poor girl to bite her tongue clean off, falling all over her like that just when she's coming round. Now, my dear, take hold of this glass. Eleanor, my dear, Sir Joseph and Inspector Boring have asked to see you. I hope you feel better, Miss Bing. Quite, I thank you. Oh, glad to hear it. Well, um... If you feel equal to doing so, we should like you to answer a few questions. Uh, first... First, I should like to request my father to descend to the study for a copy of one of the Latin authors. Uh, which one, my dear? Anyone you like. But don't return with it in less than a quarter of an hour. I imagine these gentlemen will have concluded their inquisition by that time. Yes. And now, Miss Bing... Uh, uh, we want you to tell us what caused you to fall headfirst into the bath this morning. 
I was overcome by a feeling of extreme faintness and was unable to call for help before I was wrapped in complete oblivion. The only wonder is that I am alive to tell the tale, or so I am informed by those who rescued me. Yes, yours is a devoted family circle. <laughs> oh, come now, Miss Bing, there's no need for us to fence. <laughs> who are you shielding? Fence? Shielding? Pray explain yourself. Who attempted to murder you in the bathroom this morning? Oh, come now. My dear Inspector, you are talking the most utter nonsense. Nobody attempted any such thing. I fainted as I have told you. That is all I can say. And as I am still weak, I feel sure you will relieve me of your presence as soon as possible. Yes. Of course she's lying. You mean... Uh... Sir, somebody half throttled that young woman. I spotted the bruises on her neck. You sound sympathetic, Boring. Well, I can understand his feelings. There are some women that are past all bearing, and Miss Eleanor Bing is one of them. Uh. Now, I wonder who she's shielding. What do you say to a little general interrogation, sir? Mm, carry on, Boring, carry on. Now, Miss Clark, who in this house had any reason to wish you dead? You mustn't ask me. Oh, come now, Miss Clark. All right, I tell you. It was Eleanor who hated me. She always has. But she didn't try to kill me. I'm sure she didn't. And why are you so sure? It would be too horrible. Yes, I agree, Miss Clark. Thank you, Miss Clark. That will be all. I'll ask God to come in, shall I? If you would, please. Fingerprints might settle the matter, sir. On the poker, you mean? Mm, perhaps. Ah, come in and sit down, Mr. Bing. Right. Mm. Are you strongly attached to your sister? No. No? Before or after you knew of her inimical feelings towards your fiancé? I didn't know that Eleanor didn't like Dorothy. That's news to me, I assure you. I says it's never demonstrative, you know. I see. Any questions, Boring? Um, no, thank you, sir. That'll be all, Mr. Bing. Right you are. I'll get casters. Well now, Mr. Carstairs, who killed Mountjoy? To the best of my knowledge, Mountjoy was the victim of an accident. But yesterday you said... I've that... changed my mind. Good morning. Of course, you won't be able to shuffle like that in the witness box. Who's next? Ah, good morning, Mrs. Bradley. Good morning, gentlemen. And now then, I should like to make a statement. Um, uh, yes, of course. I, I, I take it boring, will you? Yes, sir, when sir. I was invited to stay at this house, I was intensely interested from the start in Eleanor Bing's psychological makeup. Uh, of course. Uh, also uh, saying uh, here was the woman Mountjoy. We all thought she was a man. Obviously, Eleanor thought so too, for they became engaged to be married. And less than a fortnight later, Mountjoy met her death. I think you had doubts yesterday, Sir Joseph, as to the cause of that death. Frankly, Mrs. Bradley, I think Mountjoy was murdered. Ah. Then if I tell you that I had reason to believe that the murderer of Mountjoy had designs also upon the life of Dorothy Clark, you won't be surprised that I took the girl into my room. Well, we'd like to know what made you think an attempt would be made on the girl's life. Also, of course, we'd be interested to know the identity of the murderer. Until this morning, I should have said it was Eleanor Bing. Huh? Now I am not at all sure that Mountjoy wasn't the victim of an accident. How did you fix on Eleanor Bing? I haven't any proofs which a jury would consider evidence, but I could suggest a motive. Now, <laughs> that has puzzled me a good deal, the apparent absence of motive. I present you... The picture of a woman, 28 to 30 years of age, intelligent and healthy, but emotionally starved. One day a man comes into her life. They find mutual attraction in one another's society. They become engaged. Uh, yes, now, why did the woman, Mount Joy, allow herself to become engaged to poor Miss Bing? It may be that Mount Joy was urgently in need of money. Eleanor has a comfortable fortune, and the other woman may have counted on her dupe's fear of ridicule being strong enough to keep the secret of Mountjoy's sex. Oh, well. The other explanation may sound to you extraordinary, but it is more probably the correct one. Have you heard of sexual perversion? 
not a pleasant subject. Oh, I don't propose to discuss it. But I do suggest to you that Mountjoy may have formed a very real and very strong attachment to Eleanor. <coughs> it is a possibility, of course. Whatever happened, one thing must be regarded as certain. In some way, Eleanor discovered the truth about her lover. Motive. Revenge on the person who had deceived her. Exactly. That's what I should have said. Until this morning. That is certainly a very ingenious theory, Mrs. Bradley. It does provide a strong motive for the crime. Did they tell you about the watch? Watch? Mountjoy's watch, which was discovered by me at the bottom of the washstand jug. Drowned watch? Drowned woman! <laughs> that concludes my voluntary statement, gentlemen. Uh, but but um, what exactly made you think there would be an attempt on Miss Clark's life? Oh! I knew that Eleanor would kill the girl if she could. Uh, for one thing, Eleanor is quite mad, you know. Oh, I think you're wrong. We talked with Miss Bing this morning, and I never saw anyone who appeared more entirely in possession of all her mental faculties. And then the clock clinched it. Oh, I didn't tell you how she smashed the clock. Crack clock? What clock? The Freudian clock. <sighs> Dorothy's clock. Smash. Clock smashed woman. My dear man, she positively flung it on the ground when she saw them kissing. I think we are wasting time, madam. Good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. <coughs> oh, that is a nasty cough, Inspector. Hot lemon and honey is very efficacious, I believe. Let's go and have some food. That woman unnerves me. And this afternoon we must get on with the fingerprinting. I was rather disappointed not to be included in the fingerprinting process. It appeared that my thumbprint was so clearly different from that found on the poker that it would have been a waste of police time. It was at this point, that is, on Saturday morning, that Inspector Boring began to confide in me. You're looking very jovial this morning, if I may say so, Mr. Carstairs. Oh, yes. Well, I, I'm going to a wedding. Oh. And Mr. Gard Bing and Miss Clark are getting married by special licence. Are they by Jove? Oh, that's a bit out of the ordinary, isn't it, sir? I mean, yesterday we take everybody's fingerprints and today these two go and get married. Well, I really can't see that the two things have anything to do with one another. Can't you, sir? Well, I can't prove Miss Mountjoy was murdered, and yet I know, the same as you know, that murder was done. But I don't know that murder was done, as I told you yesterday. I've changed my mind. Oh, now, Mr Carstairs. If Mountjoy wasn't murdered, why did someone try to kill Miss Bing? I mean, somebody still thinks she was the murderer. And why are these two people in such a hurry to get married? Special licence, indeed. Well, perhaps they think Miss Clark stands in need of a husband's protection. Protection? Oh, Mr Costas, you've hit it. They're afraid of another attempt on her life. And that brings us back to Eleanor Bing and... This. D what? What? A bottle of aspirin? What does that prove, Inspector? That Miss Bing is a very poor liar. Didn't she say that she went into Miss Clark's room on Thursday night for aspirin for her neuralgia? Huh? Well, I found this bottle in the very front of the little cupboard in her own room. The label says 50 tablets. The bottle contains 31. And it's very safe to assume that she hasn't taken 19 since Thursday, so they were bought before then. This taken in conjunction with the fact that the fingerprints on the poker show that Miss Bing was the last person to handle it, justifies me in assuming that she dealt the blow to that dummy. <laughs> Hope I haven't been boring you. I don't usually say off a whole long piece like that, but I wanted to get the hang of my ideas. Inspector, you belie your name. Beg your pardon, sir? Boring. You most certainly are not. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, I think I'll just go and establish, if I can, exactly when this aspirin was purchased. <laughs> I hope you enjoy the wedding. Uh, good heavens, Mrs Bradley, what are you doing in that bush? Oh, I 
I thought that man would never go, and he does hate me so much. I didn't want to spoil his day by confronting him. You, on the other hand, are his little you lamb, aren't you? <laughs> well, it would seem so. In fact, I, I think I could murder the whole lot of you and still get off scot-free, even though I should be the only one left alive. <laughs> 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 what it is to have influence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now... Uh. Mm. I want to know your version of all that has occurred since we last talked together. I I'm forced to the conclusion that the murderer is a homicidal maniac who killed Mountjoy and attempted to kill first Dorothy and then Eleanor, and for all I know, may be lurking behind the summer house at this moment. Whoa! Whoa! I should run for your life! <laughs> yeah, but, but there's one point I'm not quite clear about. Uh, I thought you'd notice the screen. Uh, uh, passing over your quite unique habit of reading my mind, why did Eleanor scream like that? Well, why do women usually scream? Because they're in agony or in danger or, or frightened? Let, let us say suddenly frightened. We can dismiss the idea that Eleanor was in agony, I think. That leaves us with the alternatives of um, danger and sudden fright. Exactly. The view that she was in danger mustn't be lost sight of, and that something frightened her is undoubtedly true. Uh, she admitted it herself, but her explanation is amazingly thin. She said it was the sight of the dummy figure in the bed when she turned on the light. Now, I contend that Eleanor was lying when she said she turned on the light. Go on. Her fingerprints were on that poker. The head of the dummy was staved in by a heavy blow. The inference is that Eleanor struck that blow. She must have intended to kill Dorothy. Would she have risked turning lights on? No, 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 no. The moonlight, she judged, was sufficient. She struck the blow, and then... She screamed. But why? Because somebody was hiding in the room, and this person sprang out and confronted her. He switched on the light. It was his unexpected appearance and his fierce, almost murderous attitude and expression that caused Eleanor to scream. Not only did she realise that someone had seen her kill Dorothy, but she thought her own life was in danger. But she didn't kill Dorothy. No, but she thought she had. But... but... And, and don't you see that this also accounts for the attempt made on Eleanor's life? If Eleanor had killed Dorothy, she herself would never have left that room alive. Because Dorothy was safe, the unknown witness let Eleanor go. Later, however, he thought better of allowing her to remain at liberty to injure Dorothy on some future occasion, so he entered the bathroom next morning and, as he thought, drowned Eleanor in the bath. <laughs> hmm. I expect I... he worked tremendously hard yesterday morning trying to bring her round. Oh, it must have been a staggering shock to him when she recovered. You say him? I'm sure he's a man. Because we can all account for Eleanor, and Dorothy and I can account for one another. So that leaves yourself, Alastair, Guard, and Bertie. Which one do you choose? Uh, uh, guard is the likeliest. A fair guess, but a mistake, I think. Try Bertie Philipson. Bertie? Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> nonsense. And then perhaps you'll tell me why he didn't join the rest of us on the landing outside Dorothy's room. Uh, wasn't he there? You know he wasn't. Don't you remember how Guard teased him at breakfast about his non-appearance? He was still hiding behind Dorothy's bed. <laughs> I could wager he spent a remarkably uncomfortable half hour or two wondering if Eleanor would give him away. <laughs> y yes, yes. If, if all this is true, why didn't she? She is in love with him. One increasing purpose runs through the whole of these unhappy affairs, and the theme is Eleanor's desire for Bertie Philipson. Oh, now, I really must go and dress for the wedding. Did you say there were to be two bridesmaids? Yes, Eleanor and a nice girl named Pamela Storbin. She'll come back after the ceremony for lunch, and Bertie will drive her home after dinner. I see. 
asked. What a shame that Bertie is such a charming squire of dames. The wedding ceremony was soon over. Bertie was best man, and Eleanor and 17-year-old Pamela made rather ill-matched bridesmaids. The weather, which had been uncomfortably close all afternoon, suddenly broke during dinner. You can't go home in this, Pamela. Of course not. Quite impossible. Well, if it's all the same to everybody, I I'd just as soon not take my little old bus out in this. I doubt whether you get across Hanley Bottom anyway. It'll be flooded. You better stay the night, Pam. I really think that'll be best, Pam, darling. You don't mind, do you? Blue eyes. Oh, well, I... Oh, very well. If you will come with me, Miss Storbin, I'll show you your room. Oh, thanks ever so much. Uh, shall I come with you, darling? Oh, oh God. I say, oh, steady God. on, Eleanor. Dear me, what a disaster. Oh, it's only a vase. Cobb can see to it. Come along, please, Miss Storbin. Dorothy, Dorothy, dear... You might lend Pamela a nightdress. It may not occur to Eleanor that she'll need one. Oh, of course. Uh, hang on, Pam. I'll come with you. I expect you'll be in my old room. And, and Dorothy, if you should feel uneasy about anything, let me or Mr Carstairs know, won't you? Philipson, there you are. Oh, I hope you're not feeling sleepy, because I've got a job of work for you. Oh, dashed annoying of you, Carstairs. What is it? Help me keep watch in Dorothy's old room, where young Pamela was supposed to sleep. Yeah, well, what's the game? Where is Pam sleeping, then? Shh, shh, shh. Huh? In Mrs. Bradley's room. Come on, come on. Move the bed out about another four inches so we shall be more comfortable behind it than you were last time. What? Um, so you know? It, Mrs. Bradley seems to know everything. Are you going to give me away? Of course not. Good man. I'll tell you all about it. It'll be quite a relief to get it off my chest. Far away. Well, of course, you know I'm fond of Dorothy. Mm. Always have been. Yes. But she liked guard better. Anyway, I, I'd always felt that I'd well do anything on earth for her. Mm. Well, on Thursday night, I overheard guard and Dorothy talking about the dummy in the bed. Mm. And I was jolly keen to find out what was going to happen. So I sneaked into this room and hid. Where we are now? Behind the bed head? Yes. Anyway, after a bit, a long toddled Eleanor, complete with poker. Oh. Honestly, it was the beastliest thing I ever saw. Yes. The moon was fairly blazing in through the window, and she raised that heavy poker above her head with both hands. Shut, sorry, sorry. And brought it down on what she thought was Dorothy's head. Oh. And I distinctly heard her chuckle. I tell you, she was mad at that moment. Horrible. Well. I leapt out at her, and she screamed and ran out onto the landing, dropping the poker on the bed. So Mrs. Bradley was right. Oh, clever woman. No, there's more to come. Oh. I can't explain what happened next. It was a horrible thing I did. Awful. Oh. But it seemed to me then, and it still seems to me, the only possible course to have taken. Yes. I decided that I must stop Eleanor harming my Dorothy. Now, I want you to believe that I didn't actually mean to do her in. I thought I might be able to scare her so much that she'd leave Dorothy alone. Sort of blackmail idea. Yes, I see. Well, early next morning, I climbed from the balcony here to the bathroom window. Eleanor had just turned the taps on. I don't know if she saw me or came over faint, but all at once she crashed, head down, over the side of the bath. Well, some devil seized me then. I rushed at her and held her head underwater until I felt certain she must be dead. And then I 
climb back the way I'd come. The luck of Beelzebub stuck to me to the very end. Yes. Oh. What's that? It's Eleanor with a candle. Good God, she's got a knife. Uh. <laughs> oh. She's mad. <laughs> Heaven's sake, stop her! Oh, 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 oh. Now then, stop this! Oh. 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 Come now. What are you thinking of? You're tired, you want to go back to bed. Come along now. No nonsense. We'll stand by, shall we? In case... No, the, no need. The, no? no need for you to stay up any longer. Oh. Good night and thank you very much for your help. Oh. Yes, 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 it's all right now. Come along, come along. Be quite all right now. Oh, there you go, Angel. Oh, extraordinary woman. My hat, yes. Carstairs, Phillipson, what's going on? All the man of noise in the house, shocking. No, Good no, heaven! No, no, no. Whatever's that row? It's coming from Eleanor's room. No. Mrs. Bradley! Good heavens! Well, what's the matter with Eleanor? Is she ill? Complete nervous breakdown. Nervous? Oh, I want a drink! And you shall have one. There's some coffee and a flask in my room. If someone could fetch a cup. A cup was found. Mrs. Bradley poured a generous amount of milky coffee into it. Eleanor drank to the dregs. When she appeared to be asleep, we left her. Uh, I think I'd better... Lock her door, don't you? Mm. Uh, Mr. Bing, you better have the key. What? Oh, very well. Uh, now then, to bed. Uh, to bed. Uh, good night. Good night. Oh. Yes, well, I think I'll toddle off too. Um, oh, oh, good, oh, night, good, 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 good night. Night. Um, yes. Now, why didn't you tell Alistair? I have nothing to tell him. Eleanor isn't insane, if that's what you mean. But damn it, she's dangerous. Oh, yes, I know. But only when anybody takes a liking for Bertie Philipson. Oh. It's an awful situation. <laughs> Still, we must hope for the best. And in the morning, it appeared that the best had happened. <laughs> Eleanor's body was discovered in the locked bathroom. She was colder than the cold water in which she lay. And this time she was past saving. Not drowned, you say, Doctor? What was it then? Heart failure? Mr. Bing, you must prepare yourself for a shock. I will have to call in another opinion. What? The fact is, I believe your daughter died from the effects of poison. <laughs> So what do you make of it, Boring? Suicide, do you think? Uh, funny drug if it was, sir. Hyosin hydrobromide. Ah. Mm, not easily obtained. Apparently it's used in the treatment of mental patients. Is it indeed? Isn't that Mrs Bradley's line of country? Psychoanalysis? Of exactly, it? sir. Ah, we found a wine glass in the deceased's room. Uh -huh. It's being analysed. Now, Mrs Bradley says she gave the girl a sleeping draught in that wine glass. Uh -huh. She also gave her a cup of coffee from her own flask in a cup procured from the kitchen. And she did that in front of witnesses. <laughs> yeah, the trouble is, the maid took the cup and washed it up. Uh -huh. Didn't old Bing say that Mrs. Bradley locked Eleanor's door and gave him the key? Yes, Sir Joseph. Well, you'll find that key worth thinking about, Boring. Well, sir, we've received the analyst's report on the wine glass. It contained an ordinary sleeping draught, just as Mrs. Bradley said. Uh. <laughs> If only we could have got onto that dirty coffee cup. Oh, you mustn't assume that it would have contained traces of the poison, Boring. Now, what about the key of the bedroom door? Uh, that's got me properly puzzled. Mr Bing threw it away in a fit of panic, he says. But that interfering maid, Mabel Cobb, spotted him throwing it into the lily pond. I fished it out all right. But it wouldn't fit the door. Aha! That brings us back to Mrs Bradley. Yes, sir. 
That key fits the bathroom door. Yes, I thought as much. But the locks of the two bathrooms are identical, you know. Ah, but Mrs Bradley could have handed Alistair Bing one bathroom key and used the other herself, while still keeping possession of Eleanor's bedroom key. Ah, ha. That silly little man boring thinks I did it. Makes matters very awkward for me since the coffee cup was washed up, you know. Good Lord, no wonder you're perturbed. Oh, good Lord, indeed. Of course, they will find no trace of poison in the dregs in my flask, which was not washed up. Oh, if only Mabel Cobb had left well alone. I shall find myself in the dock before many weeks are out. You mark my words. Oh, come now. And I shall I'm... plead not guilty. And I shall get Ferdinand Lestrange to conduct my case. He's a very young man, isn't he? He is 39 and was born on my 18th birthday. He's my son. By my first husband. Really? Clever boy, Ferdinand. Mrs Bradley! A word, please! You see? Good heavens. Oh, while I think of it, Mr Carstairs, could you give Dorothy her... Little bottle of lavender water for me. Oh, yes, of course. Thank you very much and tell her my head is much better. Mm. There you are. Yes, Inspector. Beatrice Lestrange Badly, I arrest you for the willful murder of Eleanor Millicent Bing. And it is my duty to warn you that anything you say may be taken in evidence against you. Oh, God, I'm looking for Alistair. The, the most frightful thing has happened. Mrs. Bradley has been arrested. Mrs. Bradley? Oh, they can't. Well, that choice, I must say. We must find some clue to her innocence. I want to see Alistair. That's just what you can't do. Silly ass has gone to Tibet. Gone where? It's the truth. He must have left before anyone was up this morning. We've only just discovered from his papers where he's gone. Yeah, and that's a bit vague. Look here, though, Carstairs. We've come across Eleanor's diary. Is it likely to be any help to Mrs Bradley? Well, there's no doubt that poor old sis killed Mountjoy, if that's any help. Some of the things she wrote quite curdle your blood. Uh, and there's another thing. According to Eleanor's diary, Mr Bing was having an affair with Mabel Cobb. What? Yes. Fruity, isn't it? But is it true? Well, it certainly explains Eleanor's attitude to Mabel. She was trying to persuade her father to let the girl go. Uh, and Alistair refused. Yes, that explains a lot. I'd better question Mabel, I think. How was I to know I shouldn't have washed that old coffee cup? Miss Eleanor would have something to say, and no mistake if I'd left it lying around dirty. Yes, well, what's done is done. Y you didn't get on too well with Miss Bing, did you? I'm not going to speak ill of the dead, sir. Oh, pity. Well, now, who was it you saw on the landing on the day of Miss Bing's death? I... I never saw nobody. Oh, come now. That won't do. Oh, won't it? You can go to Jericho with your old questions. I shan't answer any of them. I'm afraid Mrs Bradley would have handled that better. But then I had a piece of luck. In the recesses of Eleanor's medicine cupboard, I suddenly discovered a small glass containing a drop or two of liquid. I telephoned Inspector Boring at once. What's this, uh, <laughs> the usual red herring? I've a friend endurance file, Inspector, and I'm not missing any chances. I suppose you'll test this glass for fingerprints? You suppose, right, sir? And uh, just suppose the stuff in the glass is hyacinth and the fingerprints are Mrs Bradley's. Then what? I have more faith in Mrs Bradley's common sense than to suppose any such thing. It annoyed me considerably to find myself called as a witness for the prosecution, and I was determined to give the counsel as little help as I could within the strict terms of my oath. The idiot had actually suggested that Mrs Bradley's motive for murdering Eleanor was so that she might become Alistair Bing's wife, a suggestion which the accused treated with the contempt it deserved. <laughs> this reaction undoubtedly had its effect on the jury. Clever woman. My chance came during the cross-examination by Ferdinand the Strange. Mr. Carstairs, can you tell the court where Alistair Bing is now? On his way to Tibet. Indeed. Why did he leave England? 
I understand there was an unfortunate affair with one of the maidservants. I see. Exactly the kind of man, in fact, that one would expect to find a prisoner risking her neck for. <laughs> it soon became clear that the absence of motive was the weak part of the prosecution's case. That and the fact that no trace of the poison had been found in Mrs. Bradley's possession. Or anywhere else, for that matter. Otherwise, the evidence against Mrs. Bradley was very strong. Then came the turn of the defence. Gradually, witness by witness, the strange demonstrated that nearly everyone present in that house on the night of August the 18th had equal opportunity and more reason to kill Eleanor. Finally, he came to the medicine glass I had found. Well, Inspector, what did the residue in the glass prove to be? A solution of hyosin hydrobromide. Oh. <laughs> And did you also find a bottle containing hyacin hydrobromide or its traces? Oh, we did not. Neither among the effects of the deceased nor in the possessions of the defendant? Uh, no. It is one of the baffling elements of the case, my lord. And were there fingerprints on the glass you found? Uh, there were. The prints were those of the deceased woman. <gasps> that would seem to me to point to suicide, my lord. But I'm sure the members of the jury are sufficiently intelligent to draw their own conclusions. Ah. Oh, thank goodness that's over. <laughs> Darling, anyone would think you had your doubts about the verdict. I should think anybody might be a bit windy when they've got a friend in the dock. Still, there wasn't a shadow of evidence against her, was there? I don't know. After all, when a woman's guilty of murder, there must be some evidence of it somewhere, you know? Guilty? Well, who the hell do you think did it, then, if she didn't? But the jury said not guilty. Yes, and very nice, too. Well, I like the old girl. Between you and me, darling, my sister was as mad as a hatter. In fact, I was seriously thinking about putting Eleanor's light out myself. Oh. Yes, I was jolly sporting of Mrs. Bradley. She took a big risk for other people's sakes. Of course, Mother... You did do it. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes, of course I did it. Mm. One day I'll tell you how. Tell me why. Oh, it's difficult to do that. I had no personal feeling in the matter, you know. It all simplified itself to this. If I didn't kill Eleanor, she would kill Dorothy. Or more possibly, if I didn't kill Eleanor, God being might. Or more terribly, Eleanor would kill Dorothy, then God would kill Eleanor, and the law would kill God. Hmm. Just as well for us that the British public doesn't believe in disinterested actions. Of course, if I'd been prosecuted... <laughs> prosecuted. By the way, Carstairs, I wonder who did kill old Eleanor? Or... Do you think it was suicide? <laughs> suicide? My hat. No, no, Philipson. When we saw Mrs. Bradley give Eleanor that cup of coffee, we were watching murder take place. Good Lord. As a matter of fact, I cannot understand how Mrs. Bradley could have been so frightfully careless as to leave that cup about. Sheer chance that Mabel Cobb washed it up. Yes, but... Well, why take the body to the bathroom? Oh, I think that was just her freakish sense of humour. Of course, it was a piece of rare good luck, my finding that medicine glass. Yes, but surely that was strong evidence of suicide. What did Boring think about it? Just what I thought, that it was a red herring. Directly I found it, I smelt a rat. It was so beautifully convincing. Yeah, but... What about the one big point? Where is the hyacinth? I mean, dash it, the bottle or whatever contained the stuff has just vanished into thin air. Yes, indeed, Philipson. I mean to ask her about that. If the prosecution could have traced the hyacinth to Mrs. Bradley. <laughs> But that, my friend, was what they could never do. 
You see, I hadn't it in my possession after I was arrested, and neither had I hidden it anywhere. Then where... It is you who have hidden the hearse in bottle so well. But I don't understand. Since I cannot be tried twice for the same offence, I will confess to you that I did poison Eleanor. I administered the poison in the coffee which I gave her. And as for the hyacinth, you know better than I where it is. What did you do with the little dark green bottle of lavender water I asked you to give to Dorothy? So that's what it was. Mm. Dorothy had her own bottle, of course, and returned me yours. Well, you'd better make sure that she returned the right bottle. Mine had a tiny label on the bottom. Then it's yours. I have. But why was I chosen for the role of accessory after the fact? Because Boring loved you so. Don't you remember telling me how much he doted on you? Oh, poor Boring. That man worked very hard and very intelligently. He really deserved to win his case. But I don't understand. How about I... the coffee cup? Well, that was a hard piece of luck, Mr. Carstairs. I took a great deal of trouble to wash out that cup in the flask. And I ran a dreadful risk in stealing down to the kitchen to obtain the dregs of some undrugged coffee with which to dirty them both again. Ah, so if the dirty cup had been analysed, Boring would have found coffee. I found that my intelligent anticipation had been ruined by the zealous Mabel. I was obliged to lay another trail. You remember the doctor gave Eleanor sal volatile after she was nearly drowned by darling Bertie? Yes. Well, I put a little hyacinth into that glass, assuming that it still bore her fingerprints, and then slid a fish slice underneath it, thus managing to carry it to the cupboard without imposing my own prints over Eleanor's. And you cleverly found it. A fish slice. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, what would you have used then? Oh, I, I, I don't know. A, a, a bricklayer's trowel, perhaps. Well, yes, quite good. But bricklayer's trowels are hard to come by. While the humble fish slice resides in every well-conducted home. So far as I know, this was Mrs. Bradley's first experience in criminal detection. She has, of course, since become Dame Beatrice Lestrange Bradley, consultant psychiatrist to the Home Office and a detective of some considerable reputation. It is sobering to think that the want of a fish slice could have brought that brilliant career to an untimely end. That was Speedy Death by Gladys Mitchell, dramatised for radio by Elizabeth Proud. Mary Wimbush played Mrs Lestrange Bradley, Leslie Phillips, Carstairs, Michael Cochran, Bertie Phillipson, and Philip Sully, Guard Bing. Alistair Bing was played by Garrard Green, Eleanor Bing, Rowan Sewart, Dorothy Clark, Teresa Gallagher, Mabel Cobb and Pamela Straubin, Lois Burgess. David King played Sir Joseph Mitchell, Christopher Scott, Inspector Boring, Simon Treves, Ferdinand Lestrange and the Doctor, and Fraser Carr, Parsons. The play was directed by Sue Wilson. <laughs>